really nice to be here today. Thank you for coming on this lovely day. And I'm also very happy to be in this really beautiful room again. Um, what I'd like to do today is share with you some reflections about the language we use. Should I, I like this? Is it better? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to share some reflections about the language we use uh, in talking about both the natural environment and this moment of environmental uh, challenge, because in fact, um, am I am I okay? Aren't you okay? In, in fact, um, uh, this language is so volatile. We keep coming up with terms to talk about what we think, what we're experiencing, and then the terms collapse under our feet. So that's really what I'd like to talk about. I'm going to frame. Um, some general observations about environmental language in the concept that of, of ecotones from the science of ecology. And then I'm going to develop the idea further through an extended reading of Gary Snyder's poem, For the Children. I'll especially focus <coughs> excuse me, on the last three lines of that poem, Stay Together, Learn the Flowers, Go Light, which is where my title comes from. One of the fun things for me about um, teaching with uh, scientists, as I've often done, uh, is that I got to learn stuff. Uh, I got to follow them around and, and uh, walk around in ponds with hip boots on, and I got to uh, learn the difference between exponential curves and logarithmic curves, and I think I've got that straight finally. Uh, and I also got exposed to the term uh, ecotones. <coughs> Excuse me. An ecotone is what ecologists call the zone that lies between two more or less distinct ecosystems. It's also called an edge. And uh, such, such boundary zones have what uh, ecologists call edge effect. This means a specially uh, rich biotic uh, character. For one thing, if you're lying between two constituent ecotones, you have some species from each of them, as well as some that are unique to the ecotone itself. In addition, there's typically a biotic mass that's, that's beyond what you'd normally expect in a zone of that uh, that area. So it's a really nutritious environment for any organism to colonize. The other thing about an ecotone, though, is edges move. Uh, one, of the, one of the examples of an ecotone would be the rocky shore of Maine, Rachel Carson's favorite environment. Tidally, twice a day, it reverses. It goes from terrestrial to marine and back again. Uh, another example might be a wetland or marsh, where there's seeping and draining more or less constantly or the, the pasture of an abandoned Vermont hill farm where woods are creeping in and taking over. So edges move, and what that means is that though a, a critter might venture into an ecotone looking for abundance, uh, that critter might well end up being some other critter's lunch who's just come in from the other side of the ecotone, because you never know who you're going to meet there. It's not a kind of established cast of characters, and it's always moving. So those are the two things about ecotones I wanted to establish at the beginning. They are rich and precarious environments. And I think that that's a pretty good analogy for our historical moment and for our conversation about the environment. The historical moment I'm referring to is basically the period since World War II, when there was an explosion of technology, uh, a multiplication of um, our, uh, our uses of fossil fuels, uh, and also uh, a kind of um, uh, a kind of uh, implosion of certain uh, qualities of environmental health as habitats and species both faced the possibility of extinction. So we've been trying to come up with new language that would help us think about this new world, that would help us to inhabit the ecosystem we're in, to make the most of its uh, richness, and to move forward. Now, you know, if you just described um, our historical ecotone in the terms I've described it now, you'd think that it was mostly precarious. But the richness of it, uh, which I think is registered by language, is that uh, this is an opportunity to think new thoughts, to revise our, our expectations. When I used to teach writing, I was always telling my students, and now that I continue to write, I'm always telling myself, when I encounter a gap in the middle of something I've written, or they encounter one in, in things they've written. That looks like a failure, a train wreck, uh, a falling apart, but it's also the place where that piece of writing wants to be its strongest. 
because the only way to get across that gap is to go deeper, to find a place to put down the footings for the bridge to go across. Without that gap, you could finish in a superficial way. With it, you might finish more profoundly. And I think that that's the kind of world we're living in now. We have an opportunity to rethink things, to revisit our premises, and to move toward a healthier basis for living with uh, what the philosopher and nature writer David Abram has called the more than human world. So l let me begin by thinking a little bit about why our language is so volatile, some examples of it. One term that's been used often in the environmental discourse is sustainable growth. It was used uh, so often in thinking about policy issues until people noticed that there was a kind of oxymoron built into it. Uh, any human being who never stopped growing would be defined as having a hyperthyroid condition and probably put on bed rest as having reached the point where it was hard to move around with such bulk. Uh, but in fact, our philosopher, our, our, our economists and policy people continue to evaluate political and economic policy uh, by the comparison of who seems likely to produce the most growth. We need to find a time, a way to think about uh, economy and other policies that don't uh, that aren't premised on endless growth. We need a new, a new set of uh, concerns. So sustainable growth, I think, has collapsed under our feet. The word sense of place, which I've used often, I've had it in the title of more than one course I've taught, has some similar problems. There's a kind of passive receptivity into it. In it, there's a, there's a place, and there's our impression of it from from uh, standing far enough away to look at it. It's not active energetic or engaged, in short, it's, it's come to seem a buzzword. The word wilderness, which has been at the absolute center of environmental thinking since John Muir until maybe two decades ago, also has been critiqued. People like William Cronin has begun to see it as insufficiently informed by the deep history of humanity. A native writer like Leslie Marmon Silko looks at it as a view of unroded places uh, that separates wilderness from culture in a way that native cultures uh, have never done. And finally, the word environmental has come in for uh, increasing criticism. Wendell Berry has a wonderful essay. Of course, he can do curmudgeonly like, like nobody. But he wrote an essay about the word environmental. And his point is environment, environmental, and environmentalism imply what is around us. You know, what's, what's all around us? We're in the middle, we're separate, we're looking around, you know, maybe beginning to circle and look, but nonetheless, not connected. So that's where I start, looking at these um, uh, inadequate terms and asking what could we do uh, that, was, uh, that was a little more solid, at least in the short run. And I do have a term to propose uh, for you uh, and that I'll develop. I hope that it doesn't collapse under my feet uh, before the end of the talk. I'm hoping it'll, it'll get me at least uh, that far. What we want is to move beyond um, abstraction and beyond pure rationality to something that also includes concrete involvement and personal dedication. In those regards, two of the words in my subtitle, sustainable and community, I think both have their problems as well. In our day and age, community immediately pops up the word virtual. We think of com communities have always been able to be expressed as uh, affinity groups, but online you can live and, and dwell and talk in a community of people who more or less share all of your ideas uh, while none of them may actually live in your, in your um, neighborhood. Sustainability, I think, is another word that finally isn't strong enough, sustainable. What it implies for me is a kind of holding action, hold on to what we've got, uh, dig in, make it last, Whereas what we really may need in, in, in order to move toward a, an ethos of, of, uh, of connection and commitment is a reversal of many of our current policies. We might need to rethink things more, more fully. So this brings me to the word I'd like to propose, explain, and then explore in the context of Gary Snyder's uh, poem for the children. The word is affiliation. What I like about, about that word is that it's active we can affiliate. It comes from the Latin verb affiliare, which comes from two, two, two segments. Ad, ad, that means to or at, move towards something. And filius or filia are the Latin words for son or daughter. So to ad filiare is to adopt, as in a child, or to be adopted into a family. And this familial, active, emotional, committed 
uh, and satisfying set of um, words seems to me uh, very promising for our way of thinking about living in a place on earth and living within the human and more than human possibilities. Once we form a family, we think differently about uh, what it means to be in community than we would in a simply economic uh, context. Uh, the economists, uh, classically, would, would imagine uh, uh, social interactions by economic models as each individual seeking relative advantage. But families don't work that way. If they did, the smallest person at the table would never eat. You know, we, we have commitment to each other. We, we help each other carry through the world. So in terms of explaining further my sense of what it means not only to affiliate with a place and with our neighbors in that place, but also to do so at a moment of e ecological crisis and under a sky shadowed by climate change, that's where I'd like to move into the Gary Snyder poem um, for the children to help explain my sense of the term in that context. Now, Sasha, you tell me when the poem comes up. The poem is up. Okay, I'm going to read this poem right now, and uh, then uh, I will um, I'll, uh, look at it piece, piece by piece. Snyder's poem, um, Turtle Island, was published in 1974 in a book called, uh, so For the Children was, was published in 74 in the book entitled Turtle Island. So it's interesting, this is far before climate change was a big part of the, of the public conversation. Uh, Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature, which really introduced climate change to a worldwide audience, didn't get published until 1989. At the same time, even, even given this timing, it's a poem that speaks with dramatic pertinence and directness to our current, our current situation, a situation in which uh, so many living systems are under threat. And it's one that I think brings out some implications uh, for this affiliation, this familial model. Um, there's pressure placed on our affiliation today because of, of these uh, global ecological challenges, but I think they can actually make our sense of, of being uh, connected with the earth and with each other stronger. You know, if, if your family is endangered uh, in, a, in a time of war, if someone you love is ill, you don't love them less. You know, you, you love them more. And I think that that's the invitation of such a moment for us. So let me read, uh, let me read this poem to you and then, and then uh, share with you some of my responses. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up, as we all go down. In the next century and the one beyond that, they say, are valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Well, the first thing to say, I would like to say, in, in reference to that, that first little uh, segment of this poem, is that those lines, the rising hills, the slopes, of statistics, when I, when I first read those two lines, I thought, it's a graph, <laughs> the slope of statistics, and a particular kind of graph, too. It's one that, that uh, moves along the horizontal axis until it comes to a kind of elbow, at which point it, uh, it quickly curves up and aspires to the purely vertical. This is the graph of our time. Among other things, that give you a graph. Oh, good. That's see, everybody in this room can see can see these screens but me. So I was hoping it gave you a graph. Among other things, it's the graph of human population growth. This is called an exponential curve, one that one that crosses a certain line and begins to come up and parallel a kind of implicit vertical called the asymptote that it approaches, but but never never exceeds. And as you can see in this graph, um, the, the rate of population growth has been tremendous over the last half century. Uh, one one uh, thing I've often heard, I, I, I did, should pull out my calculator and try it, but is that most of the people, most of the homo sapiens who've ever lived are alive today. Uh, and uh, uh, within the, the 21st century, it's going to uh, 
uh, probably move up over 11 billion people, according to the latest UN reports, one, the one that was issued just, uh, just a couple of months ago. Well, this, this is a daunting curve. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it seems to be a kind of will to, to a, you know, a kind of velocity that will leave the atmosphere, that will take off, will never need to, never need to stop. Uh, and it's a, it's a graph that, that, that also might be used if you had the right scales to describe um, use of carbon, of, of fossil fuels, deposition of carbon in the atmosphere, extinction of species and habitat destruction, a, a kind of accelerating, ever accelerating relative to its previous um, velocity uh, uh, development that, that is, uh, is, uh, is uh, frightening, terrifying. As Gary Snyder writes, the steep climb of everything going up, up, as we all go down. How do we, how do we survive uh, this reality? There's a, there's, a there's a quality of the inexorable to this vertical uh, momentum. But on the other hand, um, there's a sense that uh, at some point it has to curve back down around. And this is where the logarithmic, as I understand it, uh, uh, correction of the exponential uh, comes into effect. The, the other axis develops its pull. One way to talk about this is Earth is not infinite. It has a carrying capacity. We can't go up, up, up forever. At some point, in some context, it has to come back down. Uh, it's, it's common to talk about uh, our current society as having a, a fossil fuel addiction. And it's interesting thinking about it in that, in that context. If you had a, a young uh, wastrel who was, uh, say, an alcoholic and, and squandering a fortune on, on booze, really there are just three outcomes you could imagine. One is that that person might just drink up his or her inheritance and go, go bust. Another, another might be that, that he or she would um, die of uh, liver poisoning. And a third might be that that, that young heir might just sober up. One way or the other, though, it can't go on forever. There's a kind of uh, uh, carrying limit, uh, a capacity which can't be um, exceeded. And that takes us to the next of the uh, lines in uh, the sections in, in Snyder's poem. In the next century or the one beyond that, they say, are valleys, pastures. We can meet there in peace if we make it. It's amazing how this poem in 1974 uh, has aligned with current thinking about human population. Between now and, uh, I can't see the graph, but, but by 20, 2100, uh, say, 21, yeah, 2100, uh, we're, we're probably going to come out at around 11.2 billion. Uh, but already, the rates of fertility in every country in the world are dropping. In all of Western Europe uh, and in Japan, they're already way below replacement levels. Uh, the only thing that will keep them from, from uh, uh, dwindling dramatically would be to allow uh, significant immigration, which is something that's obviously an issue around the world. In, in North America and in China, both of those countries are just, just about at equilibrium now in terms of replacement after the really draconian population uh, policies in China, but both of them will begin to tail right off in the next several decades unless there is very significant immigration. On the other hand, many of the poorest countries in the world, economically speaking, are still having population explosions. India will pass uh, China as the most populous country in the world within the next couple of decades and will probably begin to approach two billion. And a number of other uh, countries uh, uh, like those in the northeast uh, quadrant of, uh, of Africa uh, have population explosions. So we're looking at, a, at a, a coming century in which the poorest people will have the fastest population growth and the richest countries will have increasingly graying populations. It's a recipe for a wild roller coaster ride. It will be a turbulent time. But the question is how can we both work together as people to share what we have in a fair approach to the world's resources and also work to help protect the vitality and the diversity of the more than human world. The, uh, the biologist E.O. Wilson, perhaps the most eminent uh, organismal biologist alive, speaks about this 21st century as the bottleneck. And by that he means 
we have a lot of things that have to go through a narrow little passage if we want them to come out on the other side and have a world that's still filled with plenitude and beauty and, uh, and health. Uh, Snyder says, in the next century or the one beyond that are valleys, pastures. The, the uh, current uh, thinking uh, in international uh, population studies is that the 22nd century may be where the overall curve of human growth begins to bend back down. That there may be places where we move past the bottleneck, there are fewer of us, we found a way to use less fossil fuels, and we can rethink the premises that got us into this trouble in the first place. There are valleys, pastures. We can meet there in peace if we make it. It's very interesting, this image from Snyder. And of course, if you've read much Snyder, you know he's, he's fascinated with East Asian culture. He wrote a whole book about a, a Chinese landscape painting. It, the book is called Mountains and Rivers Without End. But I wanted to bring up another painting to show you that I think speaks even more to this poem. Is that a picture of a painting now? Oh, good. This is all working so well now, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relieved. Uh, but this is a painting by a, a Chinese uh, artist named Huang Gong Wang. He's a 14th century painter. It's called, it's, it's a detail from a landscape scroll called Dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains. And it's, it's uh, characteristic of a certain kind of Chinese ink painting where you have these incredibly precipitous mountains. People used to look at them and think, the artists are really exaggerating the mountainness of that until photographs from southern China began to uh, circulate in wider, uh, wider patterns of circulation. And we saw that's what the mountains in southern China look like. They, they have this incredible, um, incredible shape. But you go up, we've been climbing that slope, that steep slope, and then we come down because you can't go up forever. You come down on the other side are valleys, pastures where we can meet in peace. One of the things about the Chinese landscape painters is they tend to put little human figures, not, not in the foreground the way Western landscape paintings might, but little human figures, little buildings in the midst of dramatic uh, mountain scenery. That in itself is a kind of, um, a kind of uh, implication that one way to have a sustainable sense of affiliation is to find a small enough scale to recognize each other and to remember that something is much bigger than us. They say, if we, can, if we can make it, that we might be able to meet in peace after we move through this bottleneck. We begin thinking about how to do it now. I think that Snyder's poem is not a sentimental one. It's not, it's not a glossed over vision. As I said before, I think that the 21st century will be a wild ride. I, how could it not be? But it's one where we can begin to look toward what comes next. A concept that Snyder brings into his writing constantly that's been so helpful for me is that of the main flow. There's a kind of tautology behind it. He, again, he's affected by uh, ancient Chinese thinking about Taoism, that water settles down, it occupies the low ground, non-assertiveness is the way in which we can move toward balance. But, but the, there's a tautology uh, that is oddly comforting for me, which is nothing that is not sustainable will be sustained. Who could argue with that? We can't live in the, in the current consumptive mode that we live in now. And we, and we might not get to see that kind of balance re reattained, but we can align ourselves now in our relationship to fossil fuels, to transportation, to food, with what needs to be the balance uh, found by our society uh, in a larger sense. Gary Snyder, uh, in addition to being influenced by East Asian thought, was, was strongly influenced by Native American thought, and he has a timeline that's not typical of, uh, of contemporary American writers. I've heard him say uh, in lectures and talks, you know, I don't think that things are going to get much better in the next 50 or 100 years, but I think in two or three centuries, we might really begin to see some improvement. This is, this is not a very American point of view, you know, it's, it's not looking at the next, uh, the next election cycle, uh, but it's by that same token, uh, it's encouraging. We can do that. We can do that now. Well, then, then the last third of the poem um, has the poet turned toward giving us direct advice. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. I'm going to spend a lot of time in those, uh, much, much of the time remaining on those last three lines because they're so 
uh, pithy. They're so reverberant. Uh, and they have that kind of compression of a haiku. We can carry them with us. Stay together. I, I, I referred before to a, uh, a family in a time of travail. I, like many of us, I'm sure, I just can't get out of my, my mind the pictures of those little families in the, in the Syrian refugee camps, you know, with the, the, the kids sitting in their parents' laps, looking around them in this tent city, trying to figure out where they are, where they've come from, where they go next, clinging to each other. I think that disaster is clarifying. Uh, it brings out the preciousness of, of, our, of our group. Staying together is the, is the ultimate uh, goal at such a time. I think this is re resonant for families. It also has something to do with social structures. Um, Snyder is extremely interested in the, in the Paleolithic times, uh, the, the, uh, the times of the hunter-gatherers who moved across southern Europe in the post-glacial era, uh, hunting reindeer and, and making the incredible uh, spiritual paintings in the caves of places like Glasgow and Peshmerel that are such marvels of love for the animals and love for the, the great mother. That bleak moment uh, was a magnifier and uh, staying together at a time when we're, when we're so stressed by, by uh, the challenges we face today in some ways is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate goal. It also speaks to our, our challenges, obviously, around the world, but in this country, uh, the way in which, uh, at times of stress, it's so easy to divide into oppositional tribes, uh, to be polarized and to think of our goals in relation to uh, uh, inter-tribal inter victory. Finally, though, I think what we need to do is identify with, with a group that we can take in, whose eyes we can meet, uh, to, to find a sense of renewed community that's local and like in the hunter-gatherer bands, uh, multi-generational as we move along together. The richest of those last three lines for me is learn the flowers. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the most memorable, the most reverberant of all of them for me, and I'd like to, I'd like to linger on it for a second. I was out in, in central Oregon last week uh, giving a giving a talk, and I read a book um, from the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, which was right beside where I was speaking in Bend. It's called Biography of a Place by a man named Martin Winch, and it talks about the, um, the Warm Springs Reservation has three tribes who, who uh, live on it. It's a vast, beautiful, dramatic place in the high desert, some space between plants out there. And, and the author wrote about um, and from the reservation. One memorable spring day, Viola Kalama came from Warm Springs and walked with me in the meadow. She came as a representative of the Culture and Heritage Committee of the Warm Springs Tribal Government. To the extent possible, the tribes continue their connection with their traditional lands. As we walked the, the meadow, I would ask her when to place a practice on the historical timeline, and she would answer, in the spring. She reached out to many plants, knelt down beside many others, she pointed out that dry branches from this cottonwood would make a fine sweat fire. New shoots from this willow can be fashioned most easily into a sturdy basket. That reed makes a more delicate basket. One particular ash is best for smoking deer meat. And over there is sweet grass for the spirit ceremony. There's a kind of delicate specificity in this indigenous view of plants, and it's practical. Through, through paying attention to exactly what grows in a place and what can be done with it and when you can do it, you have a kind of survival wisdom that helps you to uh, understand how much you rely on the health of the surviving landscape. I would just like to throw in a plug here. There's another very current book, some of you may know, called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's both a, a, a botanist at Syracuse and a member of the Pot Potawatomi tribe who combines Western science and indigenous wisdom of plants in ways that are really thrilling and speak to that question of, of survival. But one implication of this, uh, this line of thinking is, is not just about attention to plants, this line, learn the flowers, it's also about putting ourselves in a cultural posture of learning. You know, we, we have to know that our culture arises from the plants, just as our culture takes us uh, to them. Uh, to put it another way, we need to cultivate a worldview in which nature and culture are not a dichotomy, 
but an intimate relationship, like a marriage or like a family. Uh, this, this is a, a crucial uh, factor for affiliation today that um, uh, I find especially well uh, articulated in Leslie Marmon Silko, whom I've, I've already mentioned. She's best known for her novel, Ceremony, but she wrote a wonderful essay called Landscape, History, and the Pueblo Imagination, which has been a kind of touchstone for me as a teacher, uh, talking about how nature and culture become one. Here's a, here's a little passage from that essay. The ancient Pueblo people depended upon collective memory through successive generations to maintain and transmit an entire culture, a worldview complete with proven strategies for survival. The oral narrative, or story, became the medium in which the complex of Pueblo knowledge and belief was maintained. Whatever the event or the subject, the ancient people perceived the world and themselves within that world as part of an ancient continuous story composed of innumerable bundles of other stories. A dinner table conversation recalling a deer hunt 40 years ago when the largest mule deer ever was taken inevitably stimulates similar memories of listeners. But hunting stories were not merely after dinner entertainment. These accounts contained information of critical importance about behavior and migration patterns of mule deer. Hunting stories carefully described key landmarks and locations of fresh water. And a deer hunt story might also serve, therefore, as a map Lost travelers and lost pinion nut gatherers have been saved by sighting a rock formation they recognize only because they once heard a hunting story describing this rock formation. That's an amazing passage. Uh, the sense that science and stories are one here, just as culture and uh, nature are one, is tied up in that very traditional Native American image of the bundle. Uh, Native peoples often have what they call uh, medicine bundles, in which traveling through the, uh, the land, they'll take a little um, deer hide sack that might have a, a, a bear claw, a, uh, an eagle feather, a, a sprig of sage, a little turquoise stone, things that are iconic elements from a landscape that help you to feel that you have the whole ecosystem traveling with you. And stories can be a bundle too. Culture can be a bundle. It's what helps us to know that there's a wholeness that comes from association. The second thing that always hits me in that passage from Leslie Silko is the sense that a story can be a map. That, that story map equation is so rich. We can, by, by, by tying our stories to the landscape, we can map our way forward together. Uh, we can survive because we know where what we need exists and we can feel confident that there's a linkage between our human and familial stories and the stories of the, of the flowering earth. Now, Leslie Marmon Silco's perspective is that of a person who grew up in the Laguna Pueblo in northern New Mexico. And I know that there's an issue here for people who didn't grow out of indigenous cultures, as I, as I did not. There's a special need for a respectful care in trying to absorb the lessons of, of indigenous wisdom so as not to misappropriate it. It's important not to rephrase them, not to make them our own, never to forget to attribute what we've learned to the people from whom we've received it. But at the same time, this is not antithetical to our Western culture. In fact, there's something multiple in, in mainstream uh, culture in Western Europe and the Pacific Rim and uh, North America that speaks with, that resonates with this vision in fact, I believe that the Romantic movement, starting in about the late 18th century, uh, has continued to the present as a kind of creative rebellion against the most mechanistic and deadening elements of our industrial society. People were trying to understand how we might have an alternative to the hierarchical, domination-oriented uh, aspects of, of our world. I've, I've always been very fond of a little <clears throat> passage from William Wordsworth, who in, in lots of ways the founder of uh, Romanticism in the English-speaking world, Wordsworth kept a, a notebook called the Al Foxton Notebook, in which he n noted down little insights about nature that he hadn't worked out yet. He noted them down in kind of rough verse. But there's one that I came upon that has always moved me. It goes like this. Why is it we feel so little for each other, but for this, 
that we with nature have no sympathy or with such things as have no power to hold articulate language. And never for each other shall we feel as we may feel till we have sympathy with nature in her forms inanimate, with objects such as have no power to hold articulate language. In all forms of things there is a mind. That's moving to me because of its groping forward. And one of the connections that goes back to learn the flowers is, if we pay attention to the more than human world, again using David Abrams' phrase, it oddly brings us back into a warmer relationship with our human natures, our, our human uh, neighbors as well. It helps us to realize that we're all here together. We're all here sharing the same landscape. We depend on each other and, and uh, the world alike. I think that the most uh, beautiful expression, though, of this sense that the bonds of family are reinforced by the bonds with landscape comes in an essay by Barry Lopez, our contemporary, from his book, uh, Crossing Open Ground. It's a little essay called um, Landscape and Narrative. Let me just read a bit of that. I think of two landscapes, one outside the self, the other within. The external landscape is the one we see, not only the line and the color of the land and its shading at different times of the day, but also its plants and animals, its seasons, its weather, its geology, the record of climate and evolution. The second landscape I think of is an interior one, a kind of projection within a person of, of a part of the exterior landscape. Relationships in the exterior landscape include those that are named and discernible, such as the nitrogen cycle or a vertical sequence of Ordovician limestone, and others that are uncodified and ineffable, such as winter light falling on a particular kind of granite or the effect of humidity and the frequency of a black pole warbler's burst of song. The shape and character of a person's thinking, I believe, are deeply influenced by where on this earth one goes, what one touches, the pattern one's, one observes in nature. So learning the flowers is not just a matter of uh, learning what we need in the land and of learning respect to preserve uh, our non-human neighbors in the land. It's also a way to reaffirm our need for each other, our appreciation for the interwoven whole greater family of Earth. I think that such an attitude will obviously and naturally diminish the harmful impacts of our choices. And in fact, in some ways, that sense of affiliation and of familial uh, commitment and loyalty is finally the only fundamental response to climate change. Uh, Bill McKibben, whom I mentioned uh, earlier, wrote a book called Enough which is about the fact that uh, the consumerism and materialism and uh, unrestrained appetites of the affluent world are the real fundamental cause of climate change. Without addressing them, uh, we can't make the changes that need to be, that need to be made. Um, I think that this leads us to the third of those lines, going light. And my own sense actually is that stay together, learn the flowers, go light, each is a kind of gloss on the others. If we stay together in the land, we need to learn the flowers to survive together. If we gain an ethical uh, response to the land and to each other, we'll need to go light to divest ourselves in order to have enough for everyone and everything around us. I think that the divestment of going light becomes a positive motivation. It's not just a kind of ethical, ethically based sacrifice. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ethical uh, resource, uh, a fervent sense of affiliation that makes us want to serve the great family. My own sense of uh, a greater promise with, within uh, what I would call invitational environmentalism is that when we call each other together and offer each other good local food, when we move beyond the discourse of, of uh, purity to the discourse of, uh, of sharing, uh, it, it reinforces the other changes we need to make. Long ago, I heard a, a lecture by the, the great Canadian environmentalist David Suzuki, in, in which, again, he was, this is before The End of Nature was published, but he was talking about the necessary changes in our way of life in North America. And at the end of the lecture, someone said, but Dr. Suzuki, do you really believe people are going to be willing to make all these changes that lower their standard of living? And his response was, I'm talking about raising our standard of living. If we live closer to where we work, if we get more of our transportation through muscle power, if we 
If we grow and cook our own food, if we raise children together, if we make more of our own entertainment, we'll be increasing the vibrance uh, and the satisfaction of our, of our way of life and diminishing our stresses in affluent North America. The fewer possessions, the fewer sense of uh, individual isolated lifestyles that lie between us and the whole Earth community, the more easily a uh, significant approach to affiliation uh, can be tried. Leslie Marmon Silko has written, uh, not in the essay I've, I've referred, but in another one, of the fact that, her, that the ancestors of the Hopi people uh, uh, always uh, were, were claimed to have lived, the, the claim was that they lived in a green place with lots of water, but that the elders of the people said, you know, we're, we're getting so complacent and so selfish, we need to move to a harder place. So they, they migrated to northern New Mexico where there's barely any water at all, and they clarified their spiritual their, their spiritual aspirations and their, their ways of living together. I think that this bottleneck we're passing through is a kind of high desert. I think it has the capacity to clarify things that we have uh, been uh, forgetting about. You know, we're, my family's, uh, we're, we're sugar makers, and so I've, I've loved the uh, Abenaki uh, tale. This is uh, written down and published by Joseph Bruchak, who's grounded in that tradition, that one, one day, the creator Gluskabi was walking around in the, in the world and he saw the people lying on the ground. They'd broken off twigs of the maple tree and they were lying down and the maple syrup was just dripping into their mouths. They were all fat. They were all snoring. Nobody was doing work. The, the, the whole village was going to pot. So he got massive baskets of water in his, in his birch containers and poured them into the tops of every, every um, sugar maple tree so that now we would have to boil down 40 gallons of, of sap to get one of syrup and the people would work again and we're reminded that we needed to, to, uh, to pool our resources and move forward together. So the, the fewer possessions we have uh, coming out of a world in which we've, we've uh, questioned some of the, the assumptions about American consumerism, the, the easier it might be to seek affiliation within a gathered a landscape. And I'd like to read just one more passage from the end of Leslie Silko's essay that makes this point beautifully. This is, how, this is how our essay concludes. The bare vastness of the Hopi landscape emphasizes the visual impact of every plant, every rock, every arroyo. Nothing is overlooked or taken for granted. Each ant, each lizard, each lark is imbued with great value simply because the creature's there, simply because the creature's alive in a place without, where any life at all is precious. Stand on the mesa edge at Walpi and look out over the bare distances toward the pale blue outlines of the San Francisco peaks where the Katsina spirits reside. So little lies between you and the sky. So little lies between you and the earth. One look and you know that simply to survive is a great triumph, that every possible resource is needed, every possible ally, even the most, in, in, even the most humble insect or reptile. You realize you will be speaking with all of them if you intend to last out the year. So stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would love to hear any questions or comments you might have. This is always my favorite part of a talk. Instead of trying to pass around a, a microphone, what I would say is just speak out your questions if, if you have them, and I will repeat them so that everybody else can hear them. I'll repeat them through the, through the microphone. So I'd, I'd love to hear questions or comments you might have. I'll start over. Is it on? Okay, well, I'm just going to say a question. Thank you. <laughs> I just was curious about your reinterpretation of the idea of bottleneck because in ecological terms, bottleneck sort of when you come out the other side, like if you look at the example of cheetahs, that they had much less uh, genetic diversity and that actually was really, um, 
you know, a, a disaster for them. So I'm just curious about the reinterpretation of a bottleneck being sort of this difficult period you have to go through, like as you say, like the high desert, but then we can flourish on the other side. I don't know where I see the yeah, difference in interpretation there. question was about the notion of the bottleneck. And, and, um, and, and I think what you're interested in, if, if, if I'm, if I'm, I'm uh, right, is the, the implications of that bottleneck in terms of real biological uh, change and, and what we hold on to. And one example was cheetahs, who were all over Africa and Asia and now are, are restricted to a couple of small uh, zones and therefore their, their uh, genetic type, you know, health is is challenged. Is that, that, that's sort of your example of that. Well, and I would say, again, though I, I've gotten to co-teach with scientists often, I don't want to claim any expertise here. I'm, I'm just a, uh, an interested party, a, a, a kind of camp follower. But I think that what E.O. Wilson meant by that is, in fact, there's going to be loss. You know, uh, if you've got a big bottle and a narrow neck, not everything is going to get through it. Uh, that it's, it's, it's his way of saying, this century is a time of tremendous challenge. And, and our job, from one perspective, is to get as much of the Earth's living, living community, our, our neighbors and our, our, our Earth family, through that little restricted area as possible. Uh, and this is, a, this is quite a, a daunting image, because clearly we can't do it all. We don't have the wisdom to do it all. And we haven't been doing very well. Um, on the other hand, um, there's something sobering about entering into a period of, of, uh, of crisis, and there's also something exhilarating when everything you do and choose is so important. One thing I've often said to, to my students when I was, when I was teaching regularly and, and, say, in other contexts now is, those of you who are students at the university now, and even more so the generation of your children, will be on Earth uh, at the critical juncture in, in human evolution. This, this, is, this is the big moment where the question is, what does all we know through science, what does all the wisdom we have now that we have access to, to the spiritual traditions of the world, what does it give us that might allow us to find the possibility for wise restraint, uh, for fair treatment of, of, uh, of other people, uh, and at the same time for joy in the midst of duress and stress? I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the moment, and, um, and there's something there that's extremely exciting as well. It's not just a downer, but it is, it is uh, uh, really something. You know, they, people, um, I, I never uh, went to war, but my father was in the World War II generation, and what all of the people I, I know uh, who have been in warfare say is, in the midst of a war, what they're fighting for is their comrades. Uh, that's really what they're fighting for. That's who they're loyal to, their comrades. And I think that we're in a situation uh, where, to the extent to which we feel affiliated with our human neighbors, our, our non-human neighbors, and the place where we live, uh, it's, it's a very clarifying moment. I think we're, all, we're feeling it already. Uh, people are thinking about their diet, about how they get around, how they heat their houses, with a kind of intensity that I feel growing you know, as, we, as we approach this, this bottleneck. So it's, uh, it's uh, no joke to go through the bottleneck, but it, it has its uh, possibilities for uh, cultural renewal, I think. Yeah. Please. I'll, I'll remember you too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to have you here and Thank you. have you help us unpack this language. I really appreciate the word about precarious, the use of precarious language. And I wonder, sort of following on your comment about bottleneck, the, the word survival and the word extinction. So extinction, we are often using in terms of biodiversity. Um, Elizabeth Colbert was here last year talking about the sixth extinction. And I heard you use the word human survival once in today's lecture. Tell us about the word survival right now. Is that a word that's dichotomous with affiliation? Is that, so, is that a word that, that inspires a new urgency? Or is it a dystopic, does it have a dystopic quality, and are we at a cliff? Tell me about survival. Well, what, a, what a wonderful question. And it definitely relates to the previous question, too, about the bottleneck. Um, 
I, I, from the one hand, we could say uh, if we're fighting against all extinction, we've already lost. But if we're fighting for as much survival as we can support uh, in, in, the, in the, the Earth community, then there are many, many, many ways in which we can, we can achieve something of, of value. I'm just thinking, uh, Amy, as you said that, I was thinking, so what's the difference between the word uh, survival and the word sustainability? You know, just putting that in those contexts. Um, of course, uh, sur survival has has the the word um, uh, life life in it. You know, it's it's uh, uh, it's not so abstract as sustainability. Uh, now, nothing survives forever. People certainly don't die, don't live forever, and hum humanity wasn't always here, and we won't always be he here. Uh, species arise and and fall. Maybe another word that your question provokes this answer in me, maybe another word to bring in here is um, we want to have things survive to fill out their, their span. You know, we, uh, people talk about co-evolution. We have co-evolved co with a lot of other large mammals in the world. We dream with them. We sleep with stuffed bears. You know, we, we are part of a larger family. We comfort ourselves by not being alone as large mammals in the world. But obviously, large mammals are among the most threatened with extinction uh, in, the, in the animal world now, non-human non mammals. So um, I think their survival and our survival are important both on the level of, of, of physical survival, to have the ecosystem as intact as possible, not to lose the neighborhood, but also in terms of spiritual survival. I think that if, if we're to survive as human beings, creative and optimistic people, uh, we need the neighbors. You know, we need, we need the, the vivid, mysterious, uh, intoxicating life of animals that look at us but are, are not uh, looking as, as, we would, as we would be looking. So, but does that speak to, to you in terms of what you're thinking? But you want to say something more about survival? Because that intrigued me. Uh, I'd love to hear, tell me if that followed up or, or, or continued us here. Thank you. I think maybe other people in the room would, I, I, I am um, <clears throat> grasping around this term because I think that it is human survival is really the phrase. Human survival comes up as, um, I think, almost flippantly now without the kind of gravita gravitas that it really demands so yes. that we could hear ourselves because we're in the language of species extinction that is non-human can say our human survival depends on it as if that brink as if that um, moment of lifespan is upon us yes. and maybe you even were referencing it when you said um, this is an evolutionary moment in human evolution, yes. and maybe that's resonant with this idea of human survival. That's, yes, that's th what I'm getting thank at. You. That, that's helpful. I, I, I hear you on that. And, no, and, and clearly, human survival, although of, of extreme interest to us human beings, is not um, uh, the final issue in this world. It's a bigger world in which we're included, in, into which we've grown, and through which we'll pass in our human history. I, that's quite clear just as the earth itself will, will pass away. It'll, it will eventually uh, rejoin our mother, the sun. Um, but, but I think that, that um, in a way, the, mo the most meaningful way to think about human survival is in the context of the survival of a, of a diverse and vibrant world. You know, we, we could imagine, sometimes people imagine a living in life pods that orbit the planet and so forth. But uh, that's, that's a kind of life that is uh, remote from, from the, uh, the beauty that we find now living on this planet. Yeah. And there was a question right back there. There he goes. Uh, you, you, you're, you're the guy with the green shirt, and you've been very patient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, professor, clearly there's a, a lot of literature and research and uh, books and poetry around environmentalism that uh, have a diverse set of messages, but uh, a lot of people have been talking recently about uh, distilling in things into few terms and short sentences. Do you think that we need a more simple and elegant description of things, uh, of what motivates the cause of environmentalism? Or should we have longer, more uh, exhaustive descriptions? 
So, so the, I don't know if everybody heard that. Do we, do we need to sort of boil it down and get more concrete uh, as a way to convey some things that, that, are, that are really important? You know what I think? I think we need it all. We need, a, we need to be pithy. We need to be extravagant. Uh, Bill McKibben, again, I've mentioned, says, we need operas, you know. We, we, need, uh, we need every form. And, and a case in point is climate change. Uh, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, ways to demonstrate scientifically the reality of anthropogenic or human-caused climate change. But it's very hard to convince people, and in this country almost half the population, who are not inclined to accept that. How do, how do we do it? Um, you, so it's partly the language we use and wanting to be not just always exhaustive, uh, somehow very concrete and, and, and short, but it's also how we frame the conversations. I think uh, in terms of communicating uh, really urgent environmental uh, um, facts like climate change, we need to uh, find ways to raise the conversation that maybe brings it back to the impact of particular landscapes. I, I think in, in Vermont, for instance, my family moved here um, in 1973. Uh, between 1973 and the present, by many measures, the winter has become one month shorter. Last year we had a good foliage season, but in general, it seems to me, the colors are dimming. So I think we need to look at, at the things we, that are most beautiful and important to us, and to be even more than concise, uh, very specific and, and visual and emotional and aesthetic. So I, I think we need all of these things at this point. I, yeah, let's have one more question, and then I would be delighted to talk with anybody who'd like to talk individually. Again, thank you very much for coming. But let, let's take one more question, if there is one. I've got plenty of chance. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I just had a quick question about something that uh, was, uh, I noticed in, the, um, in Gary Snyder's poem, the imagery of um, meeting, um, meeting in peace, and it, it seemed to me very reminiscent of, of Rumi's poem, where um, it's something, I can't remember the lines exactly, but it's like, beyond right and wrong doing, I'll meet you in a field. And I'm just wondering, you're, you're talking about Snyder and his interest in Eastern philosophy, and I'm wondering if, that, if you think that was a nod to Rumi, or if you have any thoughts on that kind of parallel construction? So Rumi, a great poet who's much, much prized today. Um, I don't know if Snyder was thinking about that at all, but it's an interesting connection. Um, and the notion of meeting has some implications that go back to the bottleneck, I think. Uh, it suggests that we've been separated. Uh, and <laughs> what I call a chastened hopefulness, I think that there is a possibility. I think already we're hearing many of the words we need to hear. I think already we're receiving wisdom and we're surrounded by scientific perceptions that are just what we need in order to, to reframe our approach uh, to living on this planet. Uh, but I don't think it's going to help us avoid certain catastrophes that are looming. So again, that, that's chastened hopefulness indeed, but just, just that's the way I read the tea leaves, you know, that we're, we're facing a time in which it seems hard for us to give up on the way we've been living. And yet we can't, you know, again, E.O. Wilson says, to have everybody on Earth live the way middle-class Americans live, we'd have to have eight more planets. We're not going to get eight more planets, and the rest of the people on the Earth are not going to want to have us live in one way and everybody else live another way. That's not going to work. So we have to dismantle our current assumptions. And, uh, and we're, we're moving into, into some turbulent weather. But the notion is that we know, we know what we need to know to meet and reestablish a healthier, fairer approach. That's what Ruby and, and Snyder both are saying.